Welcome to this reader feedback edition of Forthright, uh, beginning with last week's column titled, Simply Caring Isn't the Answer to the Problem of Homelessness, as published February 24, 2022 in the Spokesman Review. Everyone cares about homelessness. A shopkeeper repairing vandalism cares. A man finding his car windows smashed overnight cares. Elected officials trying to provide a safe city care. Even the homeless care, especially when being homeless is so readily conflated with crime. Caring isn't the problem. Passing laws requiring solutions doesn't make it so, it just establishes who gets to take the fall. Debating who gives or who deserves the most empathy does nothing to manage homelessness. And manage is the key word because there's rarely a one-shot and done solution to a problem with so many faces. It's a classic wicked problem with multiple difficult to define factors in flux and incomplete net information on all of them. My nephew Matthew has spent much of the past 10 years either living homeless or on the edge of homelessness in Spokane. He's been straight for months and wants to stay that way. He was described by a former teacher as wicked smart in a local documentary, a creative thinker who knows the homelessness landscape of resources and hazards the way some people know the ski runs and terrain of their favorite mountain. It's a God thing to have Matthew with us while the weather is in single digits. He'd been couch surfing in Spokane, isolating as much as possible to avoid somebody passing him a drug pipe or the increasing drive-by violence. If you are known as a user and turn down drugs, suspicion abounds in a street culture where trust is hard earned and easily lost. First week in the country, he announced joyfully, I've already taken three long walks today on a bitter cold and sunny afternoon. Winter's chill is better tolerated when you can come inside and brew a cup of piping hot tea. It was easier for Matthew to transition into homeless culture than into the post-prison programs. He still remembers the name of the homeless man who took the time to clue him into life on the streets. Typical shelter routines are up at 6 a.m., booted out at 7 a.m., nothing open until 9 a.m., first opportunity to get lunch at 11 a.m., but there's only so much to go around and more demand than supply. He can rattle off the names of various ministries, their specialties, locations, and operating hours with a detailed review of their strengths and weaknesses. We've had many long conversations about the challenges of siting and running more shelters. Every solution dead ends at the problem of drugs, which frequently drives the crime. When he was younger, he remembers there being dirty street kids like himself, along with older alcoholics and a few addicts, but nothing like it has been in the past 10 years. Meth heads kept to themselves because it was extremely illegal, said Matthew. He attributes the change to laxer enforcement. It's unreasonable to decriminalize drugs and then be surprised there's a drug problem, according to Matthew. People used to be wary of carrying drugs or doing it openly because they'd get popped by the cops. It's what makes low barrier shelters so very challenging to cite. Not even a homeless man like Matthew wanted them as neighbors. His ideal homeless world would have all the drug action confined to one camp located away from the city center, away from the resources for transition, and away from the camps of those who are only mentally ill. There would be on-site mental health counselors at the good camps, then send in missionaries to the drug camp twice a day with basics like socks and sack lunches, with an open offer to leave if an addict is ready to change. It could be called Camp Rock Bottom, Friends who've successfully made the transition back to healthy lives from addiction all tell stories of how they had to hit their personal rock bottom. They needed tough love. Susan Schuler, vice chairman of the Spokane County Republicans, told her family's story at a Beyond Politics forum last month. She has a son who is suffering severe mental illness and is now homeless. It's changed my view on what makes someone struggle. And not that I was not compassionate or empathetic before, but when we sit here and say it is complicated, it is so much more complicated. As much as I encouraged my son to do his part and I will match, there are just days when that is not a possibility. It's a big problem and it's going to get worse. We have to rally as the adults in the room, rally harder, and it's not just about putting a roof over their heads so they feel safe. But we've got to get to how do we help them find their self again. Solving wicked problems requires creative, holistic thinking. It can't be either or. 
It's compassion and accountability. It's basic resources and logical consequences. It's free will and a safety net. It's mayor and council and businesses and home dwellers and homeless. And while the needs will always be with us, we can manage them better together. So this column drew more email than, than most politically charged columns. Uh, and it was a cool thing was I was hearing from people who also care and who recognize how complicated it is. A, a few excerpts of reader feedback. Uh, one was, warming shelters are only a small part of the equation, but an important one. And she goes on to discuss an idea that this uh, Diane in Clark Fork, Idaho has for uh, using fairgrounds buildings, which are generally made for easier cleanup, uh, less damage than we was experienced with a convention center. And she says, it's not fancy, but it could be life-saving. It's hard to help someone who's dead from the cold. She's right, and it's a good creative idea to bring to the table. Um, from Greg in Spokane, the solution does not lie in creating dependency and ignoring infractions of crime, drug, and alcohol abuse while lacking mental health support. We cannot ignore the root problem and expect it to go away. Um, for many people, everyone has a connection, someone in their family. Uh, and Joe from Colbert wrote, I have a friend that has a son on the streets, very intelligent but socially distant, and he would only visit home for a few days at a time. They always accommodated him and tried to get him to get mental help, mental health help constantly, but to no avail. Uh, Dorothy from Spokane appreciated that it's actually admitting problems are complicated. Uh, so many times people are so quick to state the solution to a problem, usually when they have no knowledge of the actual problem. Uh, Mike in Spokane, well, he said he appreciated the column as, quote, a welcome change after the vitriol yesterday blaming Mayor Nadine. Your column reminds me of the Union Gospel Mission Sum, but even more so of U-Turn for Christ. And he's had experience with that as well. His brother's been leading worship at U-Turn for Christ in California since the 90s. And uh, Mike also said that my daughter went through it when she was struggling with vodka in 2008, but I think it's needed here. And many of the most successful turnaround programs are Christ-based. They are focused on really finding that person, finding their sense of self again. Uh, one woman commented on housing first, uh, feeling that it, perhaps it had been a little bit misunderstood, and she has a point. And she says, as a concept, Housing First was designed to provide housing first, then wraparound services so that people could progress and not just receive shelter. It may be true that some programs have not remained true to the concept, but Housing First is really what we need to do. We have to do everything we can to reduce stress and meet basic needs so that people can then heal and begin to think in terms of how they are going to help themselves. And that's from Sherry in Spokane. And she's right, it, like many good ideas, Housing First has such a great ring to it. Just you know, put a roof over their heads. But it always meant that the programs that actually work like that, they work with people who are, one, have admitted they need to change and, and then surround them with those wraparound services so that they can make the change. They can take advantage of have, being housed to actually move forward. And that's where Camp Rock Bottom comes in, as one person pointed out from Dean and Spokane Valley. He wrote compassionately, but he also pointed out, here's the problem. No one wants them in their backyard. Everyone wants them out of sight. As you wrote, there are no easy answers. They haven't done anything illegal in most cases. They cannot be compelled to get the help they need. And he's, he's right. That's the problem. Uh, from Tim in Spokane, uh, like you, my wife and I study, discuss, and pray for the homeless situation. Like you, we have family members who have spent time there. Um, I agree that a separation between drug addicts, homeless, and mentally ill needs to occur almost daily and that the separate problems call for separate solutions. Perhaps by studying other cities, we could learn a different, more successful path. I am all for rock bottom camp. Uh, another writer spoke about prevention. Again, another piece of the, of the solution. Sadly, a large majority of homeless are there due to poor lifestyle choices. These choices have so damaged them, they are incapable of re-entering society for an extended period. Our emphasis must shift from them to preventing the next crop of homeless, our children. Uh, and he points out how a child who has escaped or been pushed out of a home, uh, the kids who age out of foster care, 
too often uh, find themselves homeless, uh, which leads to addiction, which leads to difficulty in developing ex an exit strategy from that situation. It, it's truly a tangled mess, and we can't face it from just one direction. I spoke with Susan Schuler, the mom who's, whose son is homeless. She's trying to help him. He's actually uh, in Colorado, and so she's been finding an outlet since she can't directly care for her son. Caring long distance is so hard uh, in caring for others here. But her question to me was, you know, she's really all in, and we, we need to face into homelessness, and what can we do to make this better? Um, and I told her, I really see the only thing is to stop making it a political weapon. Uh, no finger pointing, you know, pointing at Mayor Median Woodward, no pointing at uh, Council President Brian Beggs, or pitting the different ministries against each other. They all have a role to play. Uh, or demonizing the police, they have a role to play as well. I, being the, the most frequent victim of some of the drug crime and the, the crime that is, is out there on the streets now and growing are people who are homeless. They appreciate having the police respond. Um, so as Susan said that evening at Beyond Politics, and as I quoted her in the column, we have to rally as the adults in the room. Rally harder, and it's not just about putting a roof over their head so they feel safe, but we have to get to how do we help them find their self again. Finding self again. Finding self, self-worth, self-esteem. Believing that you're worth enough, that you, you deserve better than what you have right now. Not a political weapon. It's about caring and working together all of the ministries have a part to play, accountability and compassion. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Forthright, and I look forward to uh, sharing a future column with you.